Welcome back to another edition of the Unreasonable Odds Podcast. Steve Buchanan, my co-host Julian Edlow, doing one show a week. It's the holiday week. We're only doing one show this week as we did last week. Hey, pretty good results for uh, so early in the week with all, all the disasters going on in all sports right now. But it ended up being a really solid week for the podcast. We have a loaded show as always. Johnny Avella with Odds R will be coming up in just a few minutes. And we have Alan Bell from CBS Sportsline returning to the show. Friend of the show. He's going to be talking about the upcoming NFL board. And then him and Julian are going to talk about some of the bowl games coming up as well. So lots to get into into the show. No time for pleasantries. Let's get right to cash it or trash it. Talk about yes. how our bets went last week. I just got to say, being a holder of Dolphins plus three was the easiest <clears throat> bet of my yeah. life. That game was unbelievable. You know, Ian Book, sixth round draft pick, coming in, making the start. Might as well, they could have started Sean Payton and might have got a better result last night. It was absolutely <laughs> uh, a, a, a no-brainer last week. You know, obviously loved it at plus three, ended up closing at minus three in favor of the Dolphins. I'm surprised it even closed at minus three. I mean, I, I don't know how the Saints really had any chance in this one here, uh, but the probably one of the easiest caches that I've given all season long, Dolphins plus three, no brainer. Yeah, I I mean, if you follow my, my college football stuff, you know that I hate Notre Dame football. They're <laughs> frauds playing a conference. They just make their schedule, sit back, don't play any conference championship games and then say, oh, we should be we should be in the playoff. The one year, the COVID year that they did play in a conference, they go in the ACC and get annihilated by Clemson in the conference championship game. It's like, oh, no wonder you don't want to play conference championship games. Notre Dame quarterbacks, fraudulent. Love the ESPN stat last night. Uh, Notre Dame quarterbacks say, yeah. have lost 24 NFL starts in a row. Brady oh, Quinn in 2012 was the last Notre Dame quarterback to win an NFL game. Um, yeah, I wrote up Miami in my article. You were on them before me. You gave them out on this podcast last week before the news anyway, and that was easy. I actually, when it reopened Dolphins minus one and a half, that's when I wrote them up. I bet them anyway. It, obviously, it, it did not matter. The only way you would have made more money is if you just played the whatever, like plus 170 money line yeah. before the injury news. That that would have been nice, um, or before the COVID news, rather. Uh, so, yeah, Dolphins are a cash for, for me as well. Um, <clears throat> Packers Bengals teaser cashed for me. Packers got by by the hook on Christmas Day, and then you see the Ravens quarterback situation <laughs> kind of come into fruition right before Packers kickoff, and it created this late teaser Saturday yeah. Sunday teaser that came together really nice for me. Um, trash it side though, some, some bad ones. I, I loved the Cardinals bounce back spot against the Colts for a letdown spot. And we get great news for the Cardinals in terms of COVID cases. If you're a Cardinals backer, Quentin Nelson, the biggest guy on the offensive line for the Colts out the most important defensive piece for the Colts out and Arizona still just could not get it together. And then uh, I was on the Pats as well. Pats in a pick them. That was my best bet on the sweat. Um, and it didn't get there. So mixed results for me in, uh, in NFL week 16. And even worse, too, for the Colts is that they're um, one of the backup guards left during the game. So they were down for the five starters at the end of the day. Like, and Jonathan Taylor, but I will say, though, real quickly, though, Taylor improved his MVP case. He did. As we'll talk about with Johnny Avello on, on Saturday night. On but Saturday other night. than that first run where he went for like 47 yards, they did contain him pretty well. So it will yeah. be interesting to see how that looks this week, too, as well, when the Colts go against the Raiders, who are a really bad run defense to begin with. But just keep an eye on that offensive line thing. But you're right. That that game really did improve um, Jonathan Taylor's MVP odds. Something to keep an eye on as well. As we talk about how some of the uh, um, odds are improving, let's talk to Johnny Avella with Odds R. Find out how the book did last week. All right. You heard the music. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you see the three-man booth now. We welcome in Johnny Avello. Four odds are with Johnny Avello. Uh, Johnny, happy holidays. Happy New Year. How are we doing on this holiday week? We're doing good in Vegas, guys. Uh, good to speak to you again. And uh, as everybody knows, DraftKings is supposed to be off, but us three just keep on working, don't we? <laughs> yes, it is important to per point out that this is an off week for DraftKings, but it is not an off week for sports, which means when you do what we do, we still get to work. Yay us. Um, all right. Another week, 
another massive upset in the NFL. Uh, most of the teams, at least on the money line, that were big favorites got through in uh, in week 16. But two weeks ago, it was the Cardinals uh, who are kind of spiraling out of control, losing in Detroit. This past week, the Chargers were the team. They, they explode to the largest favorite on, on the board at, at certain points in time and lose a crucial game to their playoff hopes. Like the Chargers needed this game and it was a layup for them and they lose in Houston. So with all the other big favorites coming through on the money line, just how important was it to DK Sportsbook to get that Chargers loss? Well, it was a pretty chalky day overall. And that was one the house's biggest win of the day, therefore kept us from having a really bad day. Uh, we've had three really monster losses this year. Um, this one was a loss also, but nowhere near the, the you know, the height of those three. So, uh, yeah, uh, that that win kept it from being the fourth big loss of the year. Well, I, now we got to know if you have them in front of you, what are the three? <laughs> uh, the, th- uh, what, the three weeks that we lost were uh, the, three, the three big, lo- the three big losers that you, you mentioned. Yeah. The three big losing weeks. That's what it was. The three big losing weeks. They were the middle of the season, back to back week, probably th- a third of the way through the season. There were two back to back weeks. And then two weeks ago, that was the third. I'm talking big. I'm talking about big losing weeks. Week wise, okay, not game wise. Gotcha. Not game wise, no. You know, another interesting result was the Bears getting a win over Seattle. That team was just going absolutely nowhere. Um, was that the other big winner for the book this week? And what other games uh, helped the book the most? Uh, yeah, that one was okay, but I can't believe I'm going to be saying this, Steve. But uh, we made money on the Bucks game. Uh, the wow. betters were, yeah, I know it. The betters were reluctant to play Tampa with the top receivers. Evans and God went out, plus uh, Fournette didn't play. Uh, another okay game for us was Giants-Eagles, as some late money showed up on New York. The, the line moved from, you know, 8 to 11, but the late money on the Giants. So uh, they, they were our two modest wins. All right, let's focus on uh, on winning the public some money. Which week 16 games hurt the book the most? Uh, Washington football team at Dallas. That was an awful result. That was the biggest <laughs> handle of the day, along with the worst results. Uh, Bills at the Pats. Right beat. That was right behind it. They love the Bills in this spot. And I, I could see why, you know, let's. Go back to that one game where the Pats won and this, you know, where uh, Belichick pulled out all the stops. Couldn't do it in this one. Um, Raiders at home versus the Broncos was another moderate loss. Um, and they also played the Rams with the Vikings uh, cookout and, uh, and Thielen was questionable for the game. So uh, Rams took money there. So we got more of the same story here in week 17. We have some massive favorites once again, Patriots, Bucks, Bills, and Niners, all favored by 13 or more points. That Niners game has gone down a couple of points with the news that Jimmy Garoppolo uh, has an injured thumb. Uh, How much movement do you expect to see on some of these games and how important will it be for the book for one of these teams to lose outright? These are probably going to be some popular teams to throw in some money line parlays. So what are your thoughts on those? Well, normally betters don't like laying these huge numbers late in the sure. season. Uh, you know, sometimes they feel it's a lack of motivation or just not a lot to play for. Uh, for this week, uh, they, you know, the, the Bills, Pats, and 49ers and Bucks, they all need to con- continue to win. Uh, they all fall into that teaser area. So I would expect the combo of both money lines and teasers. Uh, this, you know, movement on these games, you're probably going to see Bucks and 49ers make it to 14 points, that area. Bills maybe 15 and the Pats to 16. Now, you mentioned the 49ers. Uh, don't know where, you know, that game's going to fall with, with Garoppolo possibly out, but it's still going to be double digits. One quick follow-up for you really quickly, Johnny, before the next question. Um, and I don't know if this is something that you know off the top of your head, but like, so when I'm when I'm teasing, I generally really want to get somebody in that like six and a half to eight and a half point range down to like two and a half minus two and a half or just a pick. How popular are these bigger favorites to get from, say, like 13 and a half down to below the key number of just seven? Because I still don't like having teams that I'm like, oh, I'm teasing them and they still need to win by a touchdown. 
Well, one thing to remember that there's key numbers in the NFL, three being the most key, and then you have seven and four and six and then 10. 10, so yeah. 10 does come into play. So if you want to just tease them down normally, get them below 10, that's one thing. If you want to get them under seven, you can go to the alternate lines and then, uh, you know, play those alternate lines to get them down. They have, of course, you have to pay a premium for moving these right. things, you know, seven, eight points. Right. Um, all right. So looking at the rest of the board, the, the massive favorites, double digit favorites excluded, uh, which week 17 games have taken the most money so far and which ones do you expect to move the most by kickoff? Uh, Colts are at home versus the Raiders. That game moved from six to seven. So certainly some Colt money there. Uh, the Cow, they've lost faith in the cards. Cowboys three and a half yeah. to five. Um, road teams taking some action. The Chiefs at the Bengals. That's kind of a surprise in, in, when you look at the two teams. But when you look at the way the Chiefs are going, uh, you know, everybody's on the bandwagon again now. So that went four and a half to five. Broncos at the Chargers. Uh, that's another road team grabbing some money. Chargers open six. Now that one's down to five. So this is a really interesting question. I'm, I'd love to hear your opinion on this here. We're really at an interesting point at the season. Teams are starting to clinch playoff spots, et cetera. What do you, goes into making the handle on some of these numbers for teams given the lack of motivation? Like the Packers basically have already wrapped it up. The Dallas Cowboys have already wrapped it up. You don't want to make something so egregious, but you also want to be hung out to dry there. So what's the mentality when making some of these lines for teams that really have nothing left to play for? Well, the first thing is to let a train go by before you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the nobody will, nobody will hear that. Nobody knows. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, these guys are pros. They get paid well. They want to win. They're, they're all about winning. Uh, but it's the inspiration in the third and fourth quarter that always concerns me. Um, you know, the divisional games, Panthers, Saints or Eagles, Washington football team, they may show a little more purpose, uh, you know, to winning games. So it is a little tricky and it, it kind of comes into play a lot in the in-game wagering. And so that's where we have to put a little bit more effort. Um, one more quick follow-up actually, Fred, because you just said something like the motivation in the third quarter in the second half. Do you see more handle on these huge spreads when there's motivation in question? Does more handle come into play on playing like a, a minus seven in the first half versus a 13 and a half for the game? Yeah, that's, that's one way they do like to play it. They also like to play it on the in-game wager and don't play the game at all. And, you know, if the, if the 14 point uh, underdog scores first, let's say seven, three, seven, that's going to take that number down a little bit. And right. so if you really feel that, uh, you know, maybe after the visitor scores first or the underdog scores first, then you'll get a better price. That's something they look for also. And, you know, if you're disciplined enough and that doesn't happen, they just pass on that particular game. Right. Um, all right, so some of these divisions are are now wrapped up. In mid-November, the Chiefs were essentially a pick em against the field in the AFC West to win that division. Um, I gave them out on this, on this podcast, minus 110, Chiefs division. I know some sharp money was coming in on the Chargers, expecting them to win that home game and have a better shot at the division, but just better team at, at a good price. I, I couldn't pass it up. Gave it out on this podcast when we had Dave Sherapan on, an, an old odds maker out in Vegas. Um, and he said he thought it was like the better, the better, the season at the time. And, and thanks to that chargers when it comes through with a, a couple weeks left. Um, but I'm sure the chiefs were one of the more popular division bets preseason, even at the steep number, especially if people during the time you could include those, uh, in, into some parlays, what's the handle and liability for you guys on, on Casey's division win here was, were the Chargers that trendy of a pick that they got enough money, or what? Were, was there a lot of charge, uh, a lot of Chiefs rather in there? Well, the Chargers certainly took some money, you know, at a at a, what people thought was a very attractive price. But it, the Chiefs were a very very short price early in the year, uh, and there was a nice plus on them. But by the time the betters were convinced that the Chiefs may be the right side, that price was already moving higher. So yeah. it wasn't during the season where the, most of the money came in on the Chiefs. It was actually earlier in the season. So we're not in too bad a shape, uh, you know, at least for the division side. 
And then with the playoff situation starting to take form, which teams have been getting the most bets or handled to win the Super Bowl over the last week or so? The Colts have been a really hot team. The Bills are in a much better position after taking down the Patriots. Just a couple teams that come to mind, but uh, let us know what, are the, what those teams are. You're mentioning, Steve, you're on it. You know, the first of all, the Chiefs have taken money all year long. Yeah. Colts were you know, in the 30 range. They're now down in the mid-teens. The Bills, uh, they weren't convinced on them, you know, back three weeks ago. Now we're seeing action there. And then this Packer team, who probably is the most entertaining team to watch in the NFL, uh, to, watch, to watch Aaron Rodgers play football, I don't think there's anything like it. I really do. I think this guy's absolutely amazing. Right now, uh, the amazing money is on the Packers. Is he amazing enough to win his second straight MVP? Because he's minus 175 now. Tom Brady, we were laying 175 with Tom Brady a couple weeks ago. He's plus 750. That's my MVP bet right now. Man. Go back to Brady. One Saints loss is going to ruin everything. No, I don't think. I think this. Uh, I think it's Aaron Rodgers. Unless you want to yeah. look at a running back, if you yeah. want to go with Jonathan, uh, you know, you might be a, taking a chance there. I think that's probably where I would go to if I wasn't going to bet Aaron Rodgers. But if you look at Aaron Rodgers' numbers. Uh, quarterback rating up around 108, 108, 110, four picks all year long. Uh, and when we look at that team, if Aaron Rodgers wasn't in there, uh, what would the record actually be? Yeah, not good. We got to look at Jordan Love in Kansas City. Didn't go well, although they did cover. They did cover, they that, cover game. that game. <laughs> um, yes, good team. Good teams win. Great teams cover. Um, all right. That takes care of it for the NFL questions, uh, but I got to talk some some NBA and some college football real quick before we get you out of here, Johnny. Uh, we talked NBA player props last week with the the craziness going on, health and protocols in the NBA, moving target almost. The the rules have now changed on the fly, um, but it, right now we have twenty eight of the thirty teams have in the NBA have players in health and safety protocols. Um, you can follow the news throughout the day, jump, jump on props. That's my favorite way to, to bet the NBA at the moment. But my question is what goes into the adjustments you guys make throughout the day? Because DK Sportsbook is one of the best at getting player props out early. And then when we get this news, it goes off the board quickly, but within a few minutes, it's, it's back. It's right back there and adjusted to, to whatever big name player is uh is ruled out so my question is when something goes off the board briefly and comes back what goes into that ad ad adjustment because for example last night the celtics early in the day we learn uh no jason tatum health and safety later on in the day we learn no marcus smart an actual injury out and you got a guy like romeo langford who before the smart news was on the board at 16 and a half points rebounds assists he came back at 16 and a half even though he was already starting that just kind of surprised me with more and more bodies going out. And of course he stayed under that despite playing plenty of minutes. He shot like two or 10 or whatever, but how do those adjustments work and how are they done so quickly? It's very true. Well, first of all, you, you mentioned it in that, you know, our, our clientele expects these props up. So we yep. can't disappoint, and, but we also have to protect the house. So the dialogue between the team is ongoing, but you know, this is a, this is really, really tricky. If a player is questionable, we have to take it down, a major guy. And if he doesn't play, those points have to go somewhere, like you mentioned. In that, in that particular instance, we thought that the points that were, um, you know, issued up on the board were probably enough in that situation. We thought those points may go somewhere else on the team, uh, and they did. Um, but, yeah, this, this is just this is – a, a slack conversation that uh, an email conversation that's just going on all day long every day yeah i i would imagine it is not easy um all right our our weekly bowl game conversation as as we do each week uh the best example of these lines that we're talking about was was the game on on monday um you've got western michigan opening six and a half point dogs they close touchdown favorites. That's how much it moved during uh, from open to kickoff. And of course, Western Michigan dominates the game, covers any number that uh, that you got them at. Although it would be nice to get the the plus money when they were six and a half point dogs. Um, Utah is a play I've been giving out for for three weeks now. I'm like Utah plus seven, Utah money line. They're gonna beat Ohio State on New Year's Day yesterday. Ohio State, top two first-round pick wide receivers opt out. Another starting O-lineman opts out. A D-lineman opts out. That goes down from seven to four. 
Um, what are what are some of the biggest bowl game movers so far and what else do you expect to move and i also want to talk about because the motivation for the bowl games is questionable the two games we know people want to win are on friday the playoff games bama and cincy and michigan and georgia do you expect any movement on those games from where we're at well you first of all you mentioned that nevada game that two crazy two touchdown move. and it didn't even matter they cut co- they covered all the numbers anyway i know let's hope that doesn't happen in any more games uh, <laughs> in the pinstripe bowl maryland has moved from a three-point dog to a three and a half point favorite over virginia tech uh in the alamo bowl the sooners open minus three that's now six and a half over oregon I, that one appears to be headed even higher maybe in the seven area and then you mentioned some, you know, the, the two big games that are going to take place, the Georgia, you know, the strange part about all these bowl games that we put up like 42, I'd say there's probably, you know, 37 of them have moved a little bit. Um, the Georgia Michigan game and the Bama Cincy game have moved oh. the least of all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, we opened up, uh, we opened up Georgia six and a half that went to his highest uh, eight came back, settled at seven and a half. So not a lot of movement there for, you know, a, a huge game like that. The total has moved from 43 to 45. And then in a Bama, Bama Cincy game, uh, no movement whatsoever. 13 and a half Bama was the opener. We're still sitting there. Now that total has also dropped a little bit from 59 to 58. All right. Well, we'll see what happens come Friday. Um, all right. That is odds are with Johnny Avello. Um, we will be back next time we see you. We'll be, we'll be back in, in 2022. So thank you for, for coming on with us this year. And uh, we'll be, we'll be back and better than ever in uh, 2022 with odds are with Johnny Avello on the unreasonable odds podcast. Yeah. See you next year, guys. See you, Johnny. Thanks, as always, to Johnny Avello. That was Odds Are. Now we're going to bring in the big guns here. We're going to be doing a little NFL talk you see here on the show. Alan Bell, return to the show, friend of the show from CBS Sportsline, joins us again to go over this, whatever you want to call this NFL board. It's probably going to change drastically by the time we get to kick off on Sunday, but we're going to do our best. One show this week, not two. So, Alan, as always, thanks for joining the show, as always, man. Hey, appreciate it, guys. And I'll say this, you know, you say big guns. That's probably only in reference to my Uber Eats order. Other than that, like, <laughs> your guests are going to crush me. No. Uh, hey, I'm, glad, dude, I'm glad to be back with you boys, man. Hey, one, of our, one, of our rare, one of our rare repeat guests, somebody that comes on, spends 45 minutes with us, and then agrees to return. I love it. <laughs> All right, let's get into this board right now. Um, as we mentioned with uh, uh, during Odds Hour with Johnny Avello, some massive favorites on the board here once again. Some just absolutely crazy numbers here. Patriots minus 15 and a half against the Jaguars. Buccaneers minus 13 and a half against the Jets. Bills minus 14 and a half against the Falcons. Uh, and, and then the 49ers. And Alan, I'm, I'm going to throw this one right to you. 49ers minus 13 favorites over the Texans. This one originally opened up at minus 15. The news about Jimmy Garoppolo came out. And this only goes down about two points here. Now, I was talking to Julian about this yesterday. This kind of feels like, you know, you're getting the Texans at the highest point, maybe the 49ers at one of its lowest points. But at least as I look at it right now, like, I feel like the Texans might be able to, to cover this game against the 49ers. Like, I, I, I am not overly impressed with this 49ers team. Like I get Samuel's been great. Kittle's been great, but it always comes down to the quarterback for me. I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo is an NFL caliber quarterback. So if it ends up being Trey Lance, we've seen very little of him. I mean, I don't know. Am I a sucker for this one here? It just when it was at 15, I was like, man, this just looks odd. 13 no. against Trey Lance kind of appealing still. Yeah. So I'll say this, man, like you're not a sucker for it at all. Right. Like I- I- I'll be completely honest last week uh, here in Nashville. I, I-, I do a-, a lot of, you know, local radio shows here. And I was screaming. I was like, take the Titans outright. I was like, take them outright. They'll win this game. I was like, because San Francisco is a good football team, but exactly what you just said. Right. Like once it gets to the quarterback, buddy, all all hands are off. Right. Like you don't know what you're going to get. 
Um, I, I, I like Trey Lance. I think he could do a couple things differently yeah. than Garoppolo can. But here's the thing also. You know, I, I'm here in AFC Southland uh, in regards to watching these teams. And the Houston Texans aren't bad, man. Like, Davis Mills is a real quarterback. So I would say this. One of your best prop bets in this game, and I've been playing this a couple weeks now, is his completions. Because 90% of his passes are five yards at end. And he hits them. Right. Like I'm telling you, man, when this is when, when those numbers come out later in the week, pay attention to him. He completes a ton of passes. Uh, so I, I'm with you. Long story short, like the 49ers are going to win this game and you are getting Houston at kind of its max and San Francisco at its low. But twelve and a half, man, like that's a massive number. I, right. I, I, it's hard for me to take it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you mentioned that Tennessee game. That was, uh, I, I wrote, I wrote up, I had to write a Thursday night best bets article. So I wrote up my lean to Tennessee plus three and never got around to it. And I was kicking myself over, over that one because San Francisco looked bad. Um, I don't, I'm not going to bet any of these double digit games. And honestly, I'm not in love with, with the board this week. And we have so many good yeah. bowl games that Alan and I are going to talk about later. Um, I guess if you made me play one of these double digit dogs, I would take Atlanta plus 14 and a half. Are the, should the bills really be more than two touchdown favorites? Like the Falcons aren't that bad. Um, yeah. They can wind up winning. They can wind up winning eight yeah. games. They're not, I don't think they'll beat the bills. Then so maybe not go above 500. They can go like eight and nine. This season, think, it just seems like a, it seems like a lot to me. Well, so I, I, I agree. I agree with both of your takes there. And I'm going to count, eh, I'm going to count that as a take because I agree <laughs> with that too. Right. So first off, Arthur Smith and what he's done with the Atlanta Falcons is pretty good when you look at the roster of nothing that he has to no. work with, okay? But the problem with Atlanta is that their red zone offense is atrocious. Like, yeah. they'll put up yards and they'll get down there and come up with nothing, 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 right? So you can make the, the, the smart, correct bet in Atlanta, but they help you none with points. Like, if Cordell Patterson doesn't get in, you're done. Now, they'll get a ton of yards to Kyle Pitts, but they don't even use him in the red right. zone. It's, it's the most strange offense in the red zone I've ever seen. Uh, my question in this one is, what is the Bills, you know, kind of motivation here, right? Like, they just came off their biggest win of the year, maybe the biggest win, you know, one of them that they've had since Josh Allen got there, okay? Yeah. Um, do they come out fired up? Or is it kind of not even to say a letdown because I don't think that there's any chance that they lose this game, but you know, what does their offensive output look like? You know what I mean? Like, I think that's a fair question to ask when you have a double digit spread here. So I agree with you guys and Julian, I agree with you in the biggest sense that sometimes it's okay to look at a full NFL board and say, you know what? Like, I'm just not going to bet a lot of these games. Like I'm going to find my two or three and just dig in on those. And that's coming, that's coming from somebody that bet, like I had a really good week in the NBA and the NBA player props right now or something with just, you know, who's in, who's out and pouncing on those is, is working great. And then I just went too heavy in NFL and gave too much of it back. I loved the Cardinals on, on Christmas night. That didn't work. Um, so well, let, let me know. say, let me say, not to interrupt you. I feel you on that. Like I, I had 10 plays this week in NFL week 16. Okay. E every single spread except for Titans, plus three and a half, and I had the money line as well. Uh, dude, lost. Packers, <laughs> lost. Seahawks, lost, right? Yeah. But NFL props have been amazing. And I'll tell you, man, like, it, it couldn't be just me, but where I found gold, just pure gold, is in NFL quarterback interception props. Like, you, you, you get a player who, you, dude, you get a player who's going to consistently them, play in the both game. Both of them on Monday Night Football. The book yep. and Tua were – popular yeah. interception prop plays and they both came through absolutely man like i, I hit on josh allen uh hit on um uh tua or not josh Allen. sorry hit on tua hit on a couple other guys right but it, 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 what you just talked about with all these like double digit spreads uh players that are coming in players that are coming out especially the next two weeks find you know kind of teams that are right there in the middle and quarterbacks that are gonna you know obviously they're playing you know every snap they're controlling the game. You're going to, you know, you're going to get, you know, multiple prop opportunities with them. Like I found more gold there than spreads and totals. They've been killing me lately. Here's, and you want to talk props real quick. Um, you know, we're talking about these double digit games. 
guess what? I'm, I'm, I thought that was going to be more like 10, 10 and a half. I'm still not betting the Falcons. I'm not going to do it. I don't feel like doing that to myself. Here's a play from a double digit game and we don't have it yet. Like you talked about with Davis Mills, we'll keep an eye for player props when they come out later this week. Tom Brady is forcing the ball to Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown is back. There's no Godwin. Evans is dinged up. Um, And Antonio Brown, who Tom Brady, you know, is like roommates with and for some reason loves. I don't get it. I say on every show, I I don't get this relationship. But Tom Brady loves Antonio Brown. And Antonio Brown has a lot of big money incentives, like up to a million bucks combined on receptions, yards, touchdowns, that is in reach for him to finish throughout this regular season. He was targeted heavily in that game. Who did they just beat? Panthers. Um, <clears throat> and I cashed his receptions over and his yards over. Um, Smart play. Now, yeah, that's brilliant. Now, like that's- I said, there, I always I found a way to give everything back last week because I also played Miles Sanders props against the Giants and he got hurt in game. I played Miles Sanders twice this year. He got hurt in game and did not return both games I played in. So <laughs> hooray. But Antonio Brown props right now. Um, that's Brady's a brilliant take. Ball. Yeah. With a purpose, whether it be even just screen passes with, you know, Fournette out, fill in for the running game, get him a reception to get his numbers out. Like the ball is going to Antonio Brown. And now it's against the Jets. Um, give me Antonio Brown props this week. I don't know what the numbers are going to be, but I want them. Yep. yep. Let's talk about some games that we do like this week. Uh, before we started recording, we kind of, uh, Alan and I both showed our hand here. Love the Dolphins this week against the Titans. Um, you know, these are two teams, and Alan, you, you mentioned this too, that, do well against what the other team, uh, excuse me, they, they don't do well against what the other team wants to do. Dolphins are going to throw the ball. You can throw the ball against the Titans. Titans want to run the ball. They're going to have a hard time running against the Dolphins. This Dolphins team is a Dolphins team that I was expecting before the season started. Now, I didn't think they were going to rope off all these wins in a row, but like they're strong defensively. They're strong offensively, which is weird to say with a team that's running Duke Johnson, all these plays, but it is what it is. But this Dolphins team as underdogs on the road against a Titans team that is struggling right now. I know AJ Brown came back last week, had that monster game, but I love this Dolphins defense. I think they're going to struggle. So for them to be three-point underdogs, I absolutely love the Dolphins this week against the Titans. I think right now as the board stands, that's the play for me this week. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I like the under in this game. So I, I agree, you know, with everything that you're saying. And especially, you know, you look at this Dolphins defense. I mean, it's 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 beautifully orchestrated how Brian Flores and what he's done with it, right? And yeah, like you said, we talked about how these two teams defensively are kind of good, perfect foils for what the other offense does, except for uh, the Dolphins passing game, right? Like that's where... Tennessee's defense could get in trouble, but Miami's not going to run the ball that much on Tennessee's defense. Like they have an excellent run defense. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's top two in the NFL right now, but here's the thing for the dolphins. All right. And, and why I'm playing the under and, and why I like your play as well is that the dolphins defense over 50% of the time run cover zero man press right on the line. And on top of that, they get pressure. They're number one in the NFL during this stretch in uh, in uh, cube, you know, blitzes, pressure rates, et cetera, on the uh, on the quarterback. And you're looking at a Tennessee team whose offensive line is decimated, and not only decimated, got worse with COVID news with Roger <laughs> Saffold going out, Taylor Lewan going out. Like you've got third string guys at left tackle starting right. So if you have a defense that is going man press on these receivers. And Ryan Tannehill has zero time to get the ball out. And they really don't have a run game. Dude, it, it could be rough. So I feel you on the Dolphins, and I, I, I'm going to play the under in it. So we, we kind of correlate here on those plays. <clears throat> Alan, what did you play that under at? Have you? I assume you've played it already? Yeah, uh, 41, I believe. Okay, still there at 41, still there. I was going to say. Yep. I didn't know if that came down a point or two. That's We're looking at a, a grinder there. <laughs> well, grinder, and I'll, and I'll tell you this. If you look at the Tennessee Titans, go back the last, say, five, six weeks, pretty much when Derrick Henry went out, okay, against the Colts. After that game, take a look at this Tennessee offense. It is absolutely predictable from a scoring perspective. I believe that they're their highest scoring NFL team uh, in the second quarter. 
they get off to pretty quick starts, right? Like they get three or seven in the first quarter. They generally get three to seven, maybe even 10 in the second quarter. And buddy, it stops. Like that San Francisco game was an anomaly. They do not generally do that. Go back to that Pittsburgh game. That's more of how they play. So if anybody's looking at it from like, you know, a first half perspective, Titans are good in the first quarter, first half, and then you can fade, fade, fade in the second half, man. They, they just don't put points up. Yeah, that's uh, – 41 is low. I want to play the under there. I got to decide if I want to play the under there or I rarely tease so, a total. Agreed, agreed. Now, but yeah, as okay. a teaser piece, getting that to 47. Yeah, see, that I, I'm with you. I rarely tease those as well, but that might be a good play. Here's the question of the game. Here's absolutely the question. What are, e- what are each team going to do on fourth downs, okay? Because you have two teams that are fighting. Like, the Titans have to win to get, you know, to clinch that AFC South. The Colts are right there, right? Yeah. Like, they can't mess around here. Uh, and the Dolphins, obviously, you know, they've got to continue winning as well. I think they sit in the seventh spot uh, as of, yeah, what, currently. Tuesday morning? Yeah. yeah, but they can't let up. Like they, So you have two teams that absolutely need to win this game. So does that equate to field goal opportunities or does that equate to, you know, going for it on fourth and two, fourth and three? I think with Tennessee, you're, they're, at home, they're absolutely going to use Randy Bullock, uh, you know, in field goal opportunities. Uh, I don't know what Miami's going to do, right? But I, I think that that could play into it. If they go to the field goal route, love the under. If they don't, I could see some crazy points getting, you know, added in here. Um, looking at the rest of the board here, like I don't love it. Um, I'll throw one game out there that catches my eye a little, and I wish I'd gotten it at three. It's now three and a half. I, the Ravens are looking pretty cooked to me. And even though they're at home, the Rams are picking up some steam, even when Stafford plays poorly. But I expect with the Ravens decimated secondary that Stafford can maybe look a little better in this game. I kind of like the Rams at three, three and a half. If I'm going to pick a side um, for this week, any, any thoughts on that, Alan? So, yeah, like, okay. So you look at that, that game, right. And you're, you're spot on on the Rams offense. Like, they're, they kind of have a little bit of a Chiefs feel a couple weeks ago to where the Beckham defense... And is- Beckham's starting to, like, become a real piece. Real and I don't know if absolutely. everybody necessarily yeah. expected that. 100%. And, and you're absolutely right. Like, you look at this Ravens defense. It's not only decimated, but the secondary out of six, you know, starters that they've had, five are gone, right? And they run cover yeah. one, and Joe Burrow has absolutely destroyed cover one. And <laughs> I was just going to say, I didn't even think to bring up, and it just came to me when you said his name, that Joe Burrow just had 500 yards and four touchdowns against this second. Day. His yeah. two best games this season are the were Ravens. against the Ravens. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It, it, they run that cover one defense, man, and they're decimated in the secondary. And I think uh, Matthew Stafford can find plays there as well. And if they're getting the run game, because this Sean McVay offense is way more conservative than, than people give it credit for. He wants to run the ball first, right? So if they can find success there, they can absolutely put up points. And the Ravens aren't not going to put up points on the Rams defense. The Rams defense is playing much better than people are giving it credit for right now. Uh, whether it's – I think they actually would have a better shot with Tyler Huntley than they would with Lamar Jackson. They'll, if Lamar Jackson plays, they'll shut him down. Absolutely. Like, they, they won't have much of a shot. Huntley is not bad. Like, he could at least move the ball down the field. If Lamar I plays like – yeah, if Lamar plays, they're toast. So I agree with you uh, on the Rams. I like that. Hey, Carson Wentz on the COVID list just came through. Really? Oh. Yep. So there was wow. that. There, there was that. Not, he's not back. He's not vaccinated. I don't. Think. I don't think he is either. Man. Okay. okay. So all right, that <clears throat> was seven and a half at home against Las Vegas. <clears throat> if he can't, yeah. If it, well, yeah, you're right. He's not vaccinated. He can't play. He's going to be out. Can't right? play. Carson Wentz is going to be out. Uh, who's their backup? Is e- is it Eason? Yeah, Jacob Eason. Yeah, you're right. Well, so, boy. oh god, unvaccinated. Yep, Rappaport just said unvaccinated. Yep, Eason is not good. No, um, he's not. <laughs> he's not good at all. You know, the problem is that Indianapolis, like they really don't even use Carson Wentz. Like they 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 just want to run the football. Yeah, exactly. They don't use yeah. their starting quarterback. Yeah, like they just want to run the ball. Uh, ugh. I, I'm interested to see where this line drops to. And I'll take ND, I think, because I, I just don't have faith in Las Vegas. But that yeah. one's fascinating. All right, another one. I, I, I want to bring this up. You guys, I don't want to commandeer your show, but I do. Oh, go bring, ahead. I want to bring it, one up it. here. So we might be looking at the last home game ever 
for Ben Roethlisberger. Against the Browns, they're getting three. They're three-point underdogs, right? I don't trust anything with Pittsburgh whatsoever, but I feel like I trust this spot against a familiar team that he's had a ton of success, possibly his last home game ever in Heinz Field. Like, I feel like this is one of those to where you just, you grit and take the Steelers, and you're probably going to be happy at the end of the day. What do you guys think? Yeah, I I, I took the Steelers in that Titans game yep. and just plugged my nose, and it worked out. Um, uh, it's hard. I know. I, I also took the Brown, like I took Brown's money line in that Ravens game where the Ravens came back and backdoored, but the, I got the win with the Browns. Like, I don't, betting these AFC North games are really a chore. You really got to think. No, no, you're <laughs> right. You really got to right. think like hard. And like and the, the scary part is that the scary part is Nick Chubb alone could take over this game. Yep. And, and and there's nothing that Ben Roethlisberger or even Baker Mayfield could do to win or lose it, right? Like, he's that good. So that's what scares me. And the Pittsburgh Steelers don't necessarily put up a lot of points. But I, I don't know, man. Like, I might play this one just yep. for that this could be it, right? Like, and the Steelers at home, like, they're just – that's just what they do. Like, they, that's just what they do at Heinz. So we, we don't have to answer the question, but I did want to put it out there, and maybe it clears itself up later in the week. Uh, but it, it's been on my mind literally ever since, you know, the lines opened on uh, Sunday night. And the Steelers with that loss to the uh, Chiefs are done, right? Uh, are they I don't think they're out yet. They're not they're out, out yet. yet. Okay, all right. They're well, outside yeah. looking in. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, well, that keeps – that at least leaves some hope. But by the time that game plays, they could be potentially eliminated. That's weird. By the uh, way, I Schefter, think, I think just the, tweeted out, Schefter just tweeted out Sam Ellinger is going oh, for the Colts. Okay, yeah, Texas kid. All right, yeah. So, all right, so okay, I don't so know if Ellinger. That, I don't know if that's better or worse. Well, okay, so Ellinger, all right, what you're going to get out of Ellinger is you're going to get six-yard and in passes, all right? And he's going to run the ball a little bit too, uh, especially in the red zone. So, ooh, this might be – let me see. Well, let's put it this, this might way, be an though. underplay here. This might be an under 45 play. Like, that might be the play here. Because what I was going to say is, realistically, the Raiders' run defense is atrocious. Yep. Who better to run <clears> against them than Taylor? I'm, I right? can't wait to see what the Taylor, what the Taylor number opens. Oh, it's going to be like yeah. a buck. It might be like 105 and a half. <laughs> I was going to say like 114 and a half, maybe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I wouldn't yep. play the under. No, <laughs> hell no. No, no. <laughs> I, th- I think right. real quick, going back to the Steelers, Steelers real quick, I think if there's any interest with me there, I might use them to tease them up to nine and a half. Sure. I think that's yeah. a smart play. Yeah. Yeah. I think there that I go. think that's the spot for the Steelers there. My brain, my brain is in a pretzel over this uh, Wentz news I'll, for futures market purposes, and I'll tell you why. The good news is I have now cashed Carson Wentz under uh, 4,000 passing yards for the season. He's <laughs> like 750 away. He needed two big games. He's now cooked. So I, I cashed that. The bad news is my my two bigger, um, or I, had, I guess I had four. I had four bigger uh, NFL win total plays. Lions under five and a half at plus money that cashed on, on Sunday. Raiders under eight was a big one for me and it moved to seven. I felt great about it. I didn't know how they would be above 500. Now the last two uh, weeks, they beat the COVID Browns to get to their seventh win. They beat the um, backup quarterback Broncos to get to eight. And now I'm pushing. I need them to lose out to the Colts and chargers to just get my push and get my money back and get out of there. And now they're going to get the Colts without Wentz. Like you said, Alan, I still, I think the Colts are still going to win this game at, at home just running the ball, playing defense, they should be good enough. Um, well, also, what are you and I Raiders both have? Game, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> well, what do you and I yeah. both have, though, as well? Colts to miss the playoffs. Colts to miss the playoffs, but is that even a still a possibility? I'm just counting that as a loss. I mean, I, I was, too, because it's like, okay, they're going to beat the Raiders, they're going to beat the Jaguars, but Wentz, if they Wentz, lose... Wentz, Wentz should be back for week 18, and who do they play week 18? The Jaguars. Jaguars. Oh, boy. But here's the thing, though, right? making the playoffs. They, well, here's the thing, though. There's like three or four teams that are both eight and six. So if the Colts lose and we get a couple of those teams winning, now it gets real – now it starts to get interesting. The Colts, the Colts would need to 
the Colts are going to beat the Jags. So let's say the Colts go nine and eight, right? Can they go nine and eight and miss? Uh, I it really I depends it on the t- Bengals. Yeah, it does. And I'll say this: it absolutely does. And using that, what you guys just said, going back to the Raiders and Colts game. So this is pretty much this is a must win for yeah. Indianapolis, right? This is an absolute must win yeah. without their starting quarterback. So let's just in our heads kind of game script this thing and say, okay, you've got a pretty conservative offense, a pretty conservative coach and Frank Reich, a good football coach, right? But uh, uh, already conservative with his starters there without his starting quarterback. Like you said, Jonathan Taylor is going to get a trillion carries in this game. Maybe even look to the short passing game to running backs with Ellinger. But it, that makes me like the under even more because I don't see the Colts doing anything in terms of risky, uh, you know, fourth down, uh, you know, uh, going for it, etc. I think that they will absolutely use field goals when they can. They will absolutely punt the ball, play field position when they can and make the Raiders and that offense go 75 yards. Like if you're going to score, you're going to have to earn it on this defense. That, that makes me love the under even more real quick too. If, if this happened, if the Colts lose and Miami wins, they're both nine and seven. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll tell and, you this. The and, Patriots, the Patriots who are 15 and a half point favorites on Sunday. Uh, one of my other win totals is Pats over nine, which is currently pushing. They better get to 10 on Sunday against the Jags because I'm not feeling good about week 18 in Miami for the Patriots. Yeah. No. So this is not real. I would love to see. I would love to see the Dolphins get in over the Colts. That would make me very happy and make me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Which money is happiness. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> um, all right. So I guess from I'll, I'll recap. I guess if I'm going. I like a I like a side. I like a total. I like a prop so far. I, I lean to the Rams, which I haven't played. I lean to Allen's Miami Tennessee under, which I haven't played. And I'm going to be all over Antonio Brown uh, props this week. Those are, I guess are my three my three circled spots here. And we'll see what Jonathan Taylor is. It's going to be yeah. It's going to be a big number. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely in on Taylor. Um, love the Dolphins. Love them even more now because if they can somehow bring my Colts to miss the playoffs bed back to life, uh, I I will kiss them. Um, that, would that, would, fantastic that, news. that would be amazing. That would because I, I after yesterday, I'm like, well, that's dead. That's that's absolutely a loss, but uh some oh, life yeah. there. But uh dolphins there too. And you know what? As we've been talking, I don't mind teasing dolphins and steelers, both getting up to nine or nine and a half. I think that's uh that's an interesting play too, as well. I think I'll be rolling with that. I like it. I like all it. right. That's a lot of any any finishing touches from NFL that we have left over that turned into more than we thought. And we got breaking news as we did this, which right. by the time everybody listens will be Old everybody news. will know. But yeah, it will be. I'll say this uh, one one additional uh, uh, number to look at when it comes out later. Uh, player prop wise, Ryan Tannehill interception. It's always uh, at over, you know, half an interception. Yep. Uh, he he's going to put one in the air to Miami. Like if you could get that number Definitely. at minus 120 or below, usually, usually his around minus 115. Uh, they, they don't, they don't juice him that high. Uh, but especially coming off a game where he didn't have any interceptions, like that's, that's not the norm for him. Yeah. So keep an eye on when that number comes out. That, that could be very nice. 10 interceptions cool. for the Dolphins during their winning streak here. Yep. <clears throat> wow. And, and Tannehill's thrown a ton of them. No offensive line help. He's going to be under pressure constantly. He'll put the ball in the air. The Dolphins will get one in that game. Um, all right. Well, Steve Buchanan's been working very hard, so he's going to go take a nap right now. And uh, Alan and I are going to be back to talk some college football bowl games because tough news with COVID, you know, brutal news here in the Northeast as I was excited to watch BC play in a bowl game, axed COVID. I was excited to potentially Wednesday afternoon, 11 a.m. Wednesday afternoon kickoff, I really wanted to go to the Fenway Bowl. I'm one of the rare Northeast college football fans, axed COVID. Um, but we do have some good stuff left later in the week. The real bowl games are here, really starting Tuesday to Saturday, all day college football, um, which is awesome. So Alan and I will be back on the other end to, uh, to talk about said college football bowl games here on the Unreasonable Odds podcast. <laughs> All right, back for the college football 
bowl game edition uh, to app to end to wrap up the the Tuesday, December twenty eighth, unreasonable odds podcast edition here at DraftKings. Alan Bell from CBS Sportsline uh, sticking around with me to do so, and I have seen you on Twitter pumping this one for a while. I regrettably have not done anything about it, but I asked you if there still is time for me to do something about it. And you answered yes. And the game that I'm referring to is uh, in your neck of the woods. It is, let's see, this is a Thursday game, Thursday afternoon game, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, Tennessee, Purdue, Tennessee. I think Tennessee opened a dog. Is that correct? Three. Yeah. Yeah. They opened and that, they're yeah. now laying six against Purdue. This is a game that I uh, admittedly do not have much on, but you can tell me why Tennessee is going to dominate and there still might be time to get in. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'll say this. You're right. The Tennessee opened a dog at what? Plus three. They're now sitting minus six. I mean, we've seen nine points of movement in this game. And yeah. first off, let me just say Tennessee should nowhere near have been the underdog in this game. Like absolutely should not have. You're looking at the fastest offense in the country. You look at the highest scoring uh, first half offense in the country. Like John, and it's, it's, a, it's Josh Heupel. Right. We saw what he did at UCF. He's doing the exact same thing at Tennessee. Their quarterback, Hendon Hooker, like they put points on the board. You remember they held they they scored the most points on Georgia in the first half, held a lead against Georgia in the first half. Now, Georgia, I'm not saying they get up early big on Bama, too. I think, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Like and that's what this team now they're not good enough, you know, to be on a Georgia Alabama level. Absolutely not. But right. it goes to show that this team puts up points, man, and they, they do it quickly. Also, they are arguably the best first quarter bet in the country. So pay attention to that. But yeah, long, long story short, you look at Purdue, their number one wide receiver going to the NFL, David Bell. Their number two wide receiver going to the NFL. Their best player on defense gone out of this game. Their second best player on defense gone out of this game. Tennessee, 100%. And not only 100%, this is a home game. It's in Nashville. It's two yeah. hours away from Knoxville. The whole stadium, uh, Nissan Stadium where the Titans play, is going to be orange. Like, it, the, I, I already know. I've seen this multiple times before. It'll be a home game for them. Crowd will be cheering like crazy. And this team has a lot of kind of familial feel with each other, right? Like, they, they get hype. Like, I, you know, you, you, you bet that Tennessee-Vanderbilt game at the end of the year where people are like, ah, nobody's going to care. They care. Like, they care about games like this. So long story short, man, five and a half, six, somewhere, wherever your book is, feel comfortable with that. Also feel comfortable with uh, first quarter, first half bets uh, for Tennessee as well. Okay. DK Sportsbook's got it sitting at six right now, standard 110 juice. Um, but I think you can, if you want the half point, I think you can get the five and a half for, for minus 120. Um, they are a good first quarter, first half team. Do you have any, do you have any preference now that it's at six? Do you think it's better to lay? the first half versus the game, just given where we're at number wise or. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. Honestly, like there's been a lot of times where I'll play Tennessee first half instead of the full game, because also understand this defense because of how fast they play offensively, like legitimately they'll score in 30 seconds. Look at their drives this season. They're all mm -hmm. pretty much under a minute. Right. So their defense dude gives up points too. So I agree with you, like against a team that is out pretty much their entire offense and Tennessee starts very, very quickly. Yeah, I, I think actually first half could be a better play than the entire game. I, I don't have a number in front of me, but it's probably three and a half, I would say. Somewhere. Yeah, I think so. Hold on. Let me get you. I'll get you what it is on DraftKings right now. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, though. Three and a half on the nose, Tennessee yeah. first half. Do they have um, first quarter? I, yeah, first quarter is... First quarter is... Minus half a point, but juice to minus one thirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're gonna juice that up. All right, so yeah, like I, I still don't mind that first quarter. But the only, my there. only problem with first quarter is like you don't even know who half. I don't mind who gets the ball. Quarter, I kind of mind who gets the ball. Yep, agreed. Um, the, there's there's risk there. The the first half is the play. Yep. Okay, there you go. So first half strongest play, I guess, with what the what the number is at. Um, all right, before we get to New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, because I have a lot of strong takes on those awesome games that I, I really like. Um, anything else in particular before then? I've, people won't have time by the time this gets out, but I've, I've tweeted out, I'm on, I got Air Force at even money on the money line for, for Tuesday afternoon. I think they should run all over uh, Louisville. 
not many games that I have much of a take on. The UCLA NC State game is kind of interesting. It opened like three, three and a half to, to NC State, came down real close to a pick 'em. Now with the game on Tuesday night, it looks like NC State is starting to take some some money again. I UCLA is pretty good, but I lean that way at, to NC State. I, I bet on NC State a lot this year and did did well with them. Um, let me see. Clemson, Iowa State fascinates me. I don't feel great backing either team. I lean to Clemson, but is the motivation going to be there? It's such a letdown season. Like, is this either this is either going to be the game where they prove a point, the defense balls out and they dominate, or they're just like, we went nine and three, we were supposed to win the national championship. We don't care. Um, yeah. Similar motivation questions for Oregon, Oklahoma, which has spiked all the way up to a touchdown spread all of a sudden. Um, Oklahoma is more talented, but do they care? They were supposed to win it all. Um, Pittsburgh, Michigan State's an old switcheroo. Michigan State was plus three. Now Pittsburgh's plus three. That's a game I'll be, I took the Michigan State. I'll look to middle. Um, I don't know what I think of the board the next couple of days before New Year's Eve. Do, do any of those games, you got any thoughts on them, leans on them? Yeah. So y- y- everything that you just said in terms of, you know, th- this board per se, is is difficult like there's nothing yeah. that like that super sticks out i agree i really want to like just numbers wise like clemson should be the bet but i don't know if they're going to be all there agreed and like you know the one thing that iowa state does man is like when when they're an underdog per se like matt campbell could dude he could fire that thing up you know what i mean but right do they actually look at it as but then no breeze hall no breeze hall the Agreed. The heavy lifting in the backfield. Agreed. Like that's the that's the most difficult part. I'll say this. Um, I think my beyond the Tennessee Purdue game, I think my favorite play, and I know that the number's been juiced now. I think it's Oklahoma. And here's really? why. Yeah, here's why. So Oregon's out like 30 scholarship players, right? With yep. COVID issues, transfer, like that's a lot. And to be honest. I don't think Oregon was all that great of a team anyway. And their best definitely, players. Definitely overhyped ever since the Ohio State. Yeah. You, yeah. Utah, who we're going to talk about plenty soon, whooped up on them twice. Twice in like three weeks, right? So I agree. And Oklahoma, here's the thing, man. So you've already got, you know, the, the 30 players for Oregon that are out, Okay. Oklahoma's backup quarterback has had action this season, right? So, you know, with Rattler gone, it's not like they're just throwing in a kid who's like, whoa, I've never seen this before, right? So, so it's, it is Caleb Williams, right? Is he? Yeah, Caleb Williams. He's, he's going to play by everything we know? From everything has, that I see so far. Yeah, I mean, it could change. Still, I mean, he's still, he has to come back and he's going to be the guy. Yeah. So he, like, he might as well play, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And here's the thing with that. And both of these teams are dealing with it, but I think Oklahoma in this instance is going to have a bigger uh, benefit from it. Your new head coach is there. He's yeah. watching, right? He might not be coaching the game, but he's there and he's taking notes, right? Of, hey, this guy, we can get rid of him after this offseason. I have no use for him. This guy quit. This guy didn't want to be in the bowl game. Like the, you, you kind of lose that, right? Because you I have like, to be I in like the that. game. I, I like that idea. Yeah. Now, the hard part is that both teams are, uh, are dealing with it, right? Like, they've both lost their head coaches. But I yeah. think that Oklahoma is going to get the bigger benefit from it, and they're going to have a way more full roster. So anything over seven, I'm, I wouldn't touch it. But I'll play Oklahoma at seven. Like, I, I could absolutely see them uh, having fun, putting up points, and just wearing Oregon out in the second half. Like, I, I could see that scenario playing out. Interesting. I'm going to have to... That's a tough. I'm gonna have to think about that one. And you mentioned Oklahoma getting the head coach. Well, where does he come from? He comes from the defense at Clemson. So with the defense at Clemson that we were just talking about, like, are they gonna be all there for this game? I don't. Man, it's I want that Clemson, but I don't know if I'm gonna do it. I don't. I'm not gonna figure that out. But let's talk about some games that we have figured out because everything starting New Year's Eve um, and into New Year's Day is is pretty awesome. We got the weird. Rutgers flexing in to play Wake. I know Wake has some opt-out guys. I would assume they dominate that game. No real interest in the the 14 and a half. Um, I got a really good price. I, I had, I had uh, Washington State like plus 130 on the money line against Miami. That one, Miami COVID uh, gets axed. Now it's Washington State minus seven against Central Michigan. 
it's hard to cap these games on the fly, but gut call, I don't mind laying the touchdown with Washington State, I feel like. But uh, these matchups are just getting, like, slapped together. Yeah. Um, where do you want to go for it? First of all, do you have any take on those two early games on, on New Year's Eve, I guess? Well, I'll say this. Um, no, like everything you laid out, it, it perfectly said, right? It, it's just hard to get a feel. I, yeah. I'll, I'll say this. I love watching Mac football during the regular season. I have no problem fading them in bowl games. Like, I have no problem. So, I feel you, uh, you know, on the Washington State play, like against Central Michigan. I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, okay. the Rutgers, yeah, the Rutgers wake. I mean, you know, it's psychological season. Like, who's motivated to be there? Rutgers is certainly going to be motivated. But does that matter? They haven't been together. Exactly, right? Like, they haven't been together. They haven't been practicing. I would be surprised if they have COVID issues coming out of Christmas, right? Like, Right. They've been shut down. They have to have guys that have COVID. Yeah. So, I that one's that one's probably just a stay away from me. But I I feel you on the Washington State, man. Like, I think think you got to play on that. Yeah, that's that's where I'd be leaning. All right. Do we want to save the two playoff games that are on the same day for last and go to New Year's Day first, I guess? Yeah, that's fine. Um, That seems to make more sense. I love I mean, I'm I'm very excited for the playoff games. I'm jacked up for the playoff games. I'm a huge Bama guy. I got my Bama futures. I thought they were dead. They are Undertaker gif alive and I'm pumped. Um, But the New Year's Day bowls are awesome and i have a bet on almost all of them um just going in order of time noon on the east we got penn state arkansas i played arkansas at plus three i played him at plus 130 on the money line and then i gave him out on twitter as a two unit play a couple of nights ago at even money on the money line um they had a great season and should be fully motivated for this bowl most of their guys in for this bowl Whereas Penn State really fell apart late in the season. They got their wide receiver one declaring for the NFL draft. He's he's out to prep for that. Just two teams going in different directions, different motivations. I'm all about, I, like, this game being a pick kind of feels like a joke to me. Arkansas should be laying points. I, I love Arkansas. I, I, I mean, I'm going to bet mostly the SEC schools in these bowl games anyway, but I love Arkansas in this spot. Yeah. I can't, I can't disagree with you at all. Sam Pittman's done a hell of a job at Arkansas. He is a motivator type of guy. I know James Franklin, he is too. Saw him a lot in Nashville when he was at Vanderbilt. He's absolutely that yeah. same style. But Sam Pittman is Arkansas. He looks like Arkansas. He talks like Arkansas. Like, he's the perfect coach for there. And that's why it's worked, right? Because everybody buys in to what he's saying, right? Like, he's just, he's a down south guy, right? So I, I feel you in that Arkansas is a tough team, man. They're, they're better than people give them credit for. So absolutely feel you on that. Also, there is something to be said about college head coaches when they get an extension in bowl games. And I like fading them, right? I oh, love wow. fading them when they get an extension. Because they're getting comfortable. Yep, 100%. 100%. So I'm with you on Arkansas all day long. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, okay, an hour later. We have kicking off Oklahoma State and Notre Dame, sitting at two and a half on DK Sportsbook, the Irish minus 135 on the money line. I am speaking generally right now. I'm not speaking about this game. I hate Notre Dame football. I love the stat from ESPN Stats and Info on on Monday night. Ian Book becomes the 24th consecutive losing start for a Notre Dame quarterback in the NFL. Their last win, 2012, Brady Quinn. Um, Wow. Notre Dame football. You're a bunch of frauds. You're not in division. You make your own schedule. You sit out conference championship week and then tell everybody why you should be in the college football playoff. The one year that you did join a uh, conference, the ACC, you got absolutely smoked by Clemson, showing why you want to sit back and not play and just tell everybody that you're pretending to be good. Not a Notre Dame football guy. However, love Notre Dame. I put them out on Twitter as a bet at minus two in this bowl game. Because and they're missing their their top ten pick the the safety who is spectacular. Um, but I don't think they'll need him for this game. The rest of them are pretty much all in. They should be very motivated because they got the coach that they wanted to get with Brian Kelly leaving. They're going to want to stick it to Brian Kelly. He left for this bowl game when they did still technically have national title hopes alive. They got the guy they wanted to replace him, and they're going to play for him in this spot. And on the Oklahoma State side. Coming off, you know, you had a shot at the college football playoff. You came up flat, goal line stop, 
that's got to be deflating. The offense can't move the ball. I, I, like Notre Dame is going to shut that offense down. I hate Notre Dame football, but I have to bet with my head. Took him in this spot. 100%. Absolutely love it. I, I think that that's one of the strongest plays in all of these bowl games. For everything that you laid out, not to mention, you know, their new head coach, uh, Marcus Freeman, I believe. Yeah. Marcus, Marcus Freeman. Freeman. Yep. He is and has been, you know, under Brian Kelly, their ace recruiter as well. And he yeah. absolutely knows that not only sticking it, you know, to Brian Kelly and, and people leaving, like there's that factor. He absolutely understands the recruiting aspect of this of Notre Dame's not going anywhere, boys. Like you're still wanting to come to South Bend, right? And how do you do that? You beat the hell out of somebody in a bowl game, a big name in a bowl game. Yep. I'm with you. If you're getting it, I think it sits what you said, two and a half right now. Two and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Notre Dame wins this by double digits and they don't win many games by double digits because they don't score a ton, but I right. could see it absolutely in this game because they won't stop in the second half. They'll, they'll absolutely keep the foot on the gas pedal. Yep. Um, all right. Kentucky, Iowa, Kentucky opened a dog. Now they're minus three. I didn't put this out as a play, but I did grab some Kentucky around a pick. I, I think Iowa and that, here we go again with my SEC, but like, I think <laughs> Iowa would have been trash. Who was once number two in the nation would have been trash in the SEC. Um, so lean to Kentucky there. I don't know about it. Minus three. I probably still like it. Less of a take here, but but certainly a Kentucky lean, I guess, for me. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And I know that I just spoke about fading coaches who get extensions. This is the one instance where I'll throw that aside because everybody's fired up that Stoops, uh, Mark Stoops, is coming back because a lot of people thought that he was going to take the Oklahoma job with take his brother. Jobs, yeah. yeah, Bob Stoops running the thing, right? Mark Stoops is a hell of a coach. And if people haven't paid attention to him, he's really, he's really, really good. He's done a great job at Kentucky over the last three, four five years. This is a Kentucky team that can put up points too, right? They got to shoot out yeah. with Tennessee and not that Tennessee's a great team by any means, but they could get, they could play any style of game that you want to get down at, right? Like if you want to play a 17, 17 game, cool. If you want to play a 45, 45 game, cool. Like they, they'll, they'll go either way that you want to do it. And yeah. I, even though I love Iowa in it, it, like in terms of, I respect that, you know, they win nine, 10 games every single year. I'm not an Iowa fan, but I respect the wins they put up. I mean, if Kentucky gets to 13, this thing's kind of done, right? Like what is like Kentucky's defense isn't that bad. Like right. what is Iowa going to do? So I, I'm with you. It's, it's bet Kentucky or, or stay away. All right. I'm skipping over one game real quick. Here's a game I haven't bet. Baylor, Ole Miss, the nightcap. Um, big surprise. I lean SEC as long as Matt Corral is going to play in this one, but I haven't bet anything, um, any take on, on Baylor, Ole Miss. Uh, Matt Corral's that entire game. If he plays, yeah. take Ole Miss. If he doesn't play, I, 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 would, I would probably go the other route. I will say right. this. Lane Kiffin gets $100,000 cash for every non-conference win that he collects and go back and look hmm. at his non-conference games, a great bet because he ensures that they're going to win that game. So if corrals in, yeah, absolutely. At one and a half Lane Kiffin will make sure that he's collecting on that. Interesting. I like that angle. I, a lot of things you'll do for, for a hundred grand. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> man. All right. The game that I skipped. Utah and Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, my favorite bowl game, and you said maybe yours as well. Um, sits at four on DraftKings Sportsbook right now with Utah plus 165 on the money line. I gave this out three weeks ago as a big play at Utah plus seven, plus one, uh, plus 235 on the money line. I added to it more this week on both the seven, uh, six and a half, and the money line. Ohio State. Two first-round pick wide receivers opt out. An offensive lineman opts out. Starting a defensive start, uh, starter on the on the D line opts out. Um, I like having the points to be safe. Utah's winning this game. Utah started Cam Rising from the start of the season. They would potentially be a playoff team if they didn't go with Charlie Brewer. They've been hot, rolling down the stretch. Ohio State, who lost to Oregon at home, this is the same Utah team that blew that Oregon team out of the water twice motivation this team's rolling they're going to be up for this game ohio state kind of like we talked about clemson down for this game they, they wanted to be in the playoff have a chance at the national title or bust and it's bust and they're having guys sit out um 
I think Utah is just going to dominate this game. Yep, I completely agree. Uh, I, I would, I, I've already played Utah, you know, at plus six and a half. Uh, I've played I've, Utah just a million times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've played Utah money line, right? Like, I agree with you. Uh, because here's the thing. Uh, it's going to be all Utah fans that are out there, right? Like, there'll be some Ohio State fans, but I've already seen it in a lot of guys that, that I talk to that cover Ohio State. Like, not that there's apathy in the program, but it's just – you know does the game mean that much yeah and it's like you know it's kind of like alabama when they're not in a title game like if they go to like say like the sugar bowl right yeah like it's a big bowl to everybody else but alabama fans are like "Eh, am i gonna spend the money like that's a thousand dollar trip like who cares you know what i mean so i don't think you're gonna have a ton of Ohio State. there'll be some there because Ohio state's that big but you're gonna have a home field you know crowd for utah What you talked about in regards to the players that are out for Ohio State, I don't think that many of them, quite frankly, even want to be at practice right now. I don't think that they want to travel, especially after Christmas, New Year's. Like, that's a time when you want to be back with your boys at, you know, wherever you're from, right? Your girlfriend, well, whoever, right? Like, you don't want to really be even be playing in this game because there's nothing in the game for you to win after that, okay? Yeah. Lastly, the worst thing that you could face in a game where you're just kind of, eh, I don't care. Like we'll be here. Cool. Whatever is, is a team like Utah because they go in looking for a fist fight. They will make you fist fight right. them for 60 minutes. Like that's, that's all that they do. Like they want to fight you. It's all physicality. It's all aggressiveness. And the minute that you kind of give in, they get worse, right? Like they just start beating you down, man, physically. So I agree with you. I absolutely love Utah in this game. Yeah. Utah is my favorite, favorite bowl game by a mile. Um, all right. We're running long, but we have to touch on the, the real games, the big <laughs> games. Cincy, 13 and a half point dogs to Bama, Michigan, seven and a half point dogs to Georgia. You can probably guess where I'm going in this game, but I'm in these games, but I'm not laying the 13 and a half with Bama for the full game. I, I do think that is silly. Um, I have Alabama. I've kind of been picking like big NFL favorites over the last few weeks. The, and these aren't plays you give out. These are just kind of personal plays. Yeah. Each week since the this game came on the board, I've been taking like my favorite NFL favorite on the money line and pairing it with Alabama. So I just have a handful of parlays that just end with Alabama money, <laughs> um, which is a steep price, but like, they got me what I wanted. Like the NFL winners all got through and now I just need Bama to win and I can cheer for my team in the game, but not to win by two touchdowns, which is a lot and get through. And I think we all think Alabama will with respect to Cincy get through since he does have, what I do like is since he has two NFL corners and Alabama has good receivers, even without Mechie, which is a big piece. So like maybe they'll challenge a bit there. I think Alabama will still ultimately have its way. Alabama first half has been a big bet over the last few years. Um, if you lay any points with them, I, I think I'll make a small play maybe on Alabama, like minus seven first half. I think that's fair. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not there for the full game. I, I do think it's kind of too, too many points. Um, where's your head at on this one? Yep. So I, I pretty much agree with a lot of what you just said. Um, I, I've already played it. I'm on the under 58 and a half. I believe it sits at 58 now. Obviously okay. still love it there. And I'll tell you exactly why. All right. Everything you laid out there, Cincinnati is actually a defensive team. Like, people that yeah. haven't really watched them this year, they think they're, like, high-flying offense. It's not them at all. Like, they're a lower-scoring team. They just they play really good defense. Their offense is good, don't get me wrong, but it's not like, you know, an offense that's putting up 60 in a game, right? Like, they're, they're going to make you kind of fight for it. But here's the deal, man. I think Nick Saban, that first Patriots-Bills game, as soon as that game was going on, it clicked in my head. I was like... This is exactly what Nick Saban's going to do against Cincinnati. He's thinking in his head, yeah, I could beat you 45 to 35, but I'd much rather beat you 27 to 10, right? Like, just take you out of this game. You're not going to score any points. You're going to have to earn every freaking yard that you get. Like, it's going to be a fight. And I think that Alabama can absolutely do that. Plus, it probably keeps them healthy for the national championship game. Second thing, if you're Cincinnati how Luke Fickle is going to go about coaching this game specifically in the first half is that you can't win the game 
in the first half, but you can absolutely lose the game in the first half. So he's not going to be risky. He's going to be conservative. If he has to play field position against Alabama and he's down 10 to 3, 13 to 3, 13 to 6, that's absolutely okay. Live to get to halftime and then crazy things can happen, right? So, yeah, man, like I love the under in this game. I love. I don't know about love Alabama in the first half, but I could see them putting up some points uh, against Cincinnati. But uh, for me, the play for me is, is the under 58 and a half. Uh, I I think that this game comes well below that. All right. Very fair. Um, I'll also say this real quick. Alabama at AT AT&T stadium played five (laughs) times under Nick Saban, five and oh, all five (laughs) against ranked teams. And he has an average margin of victory of 29.2 points. They handle Ooh. business at AT&T Stadium. Yeah. I like that stat. That caught my eye. Um, all right. Georgia, Michigan. I wish this was six and a half, but I still, I, I like Georgia. I haven't laid the points. I have Georgia as uh, the last leg of a teaser already that, is, that has come through for me. Um, I think Georgia is a good teaser piece. I don't tease much college football, but I think they're a good teaser piece. I think they win. I think we get the SEC championship. Um but Michigan's better than we give them. We give them credit for, and they can run the ball. We'll see if they can run the ball against Georgia, but they can run the ball. Uh, anything in this one? So yeah, again, I, I agree with you. Oh my, I haven't bet it yet. My play is going to be letting this number go up. Michigan plus eight. Michigan eight and a half. However high I can get it, and I'm going to play Michigan with the spread. Right? It, okay. it, anything above eight, because I think it'll be a, a, a pretty tight game. Um, but yeah, I think Georgia does win it. Now, the interesting part is this, is that what you said, Michigan's offense is better than people give it credit for. They lead the country in, uh, uh, 50 plus yard plays from scrimmage, 60 plus yard plays from scrimmage and 70 plus yard plays from scrimmage. That's Michigan. Who would have thought that? Right. And also Michigan, you know, you kind of worry about the quarterback position in regards to if they have to go to a passing game, but the game script dictates that. Well, for everything that Georgia does well defensively, they don't get pressure on the quarterback all that much. Uh, They're unbelievable at everything else, but your quarterback does have a little bit of time. So long story short, Georgia wins the game. Anything eight or above, I'm going to ride Michigan with the spread and just kind of cross my fingers that this game is tight. All right. Um, Last question. Bama, Georgia, who wins it? Alabama. Um, I think that Kirby Smart and that's yeah, what I like to hear. Yeah, like it's it's just it's too much, man. Like Kirby Smart and Georgia, there's something there mentally in regards to getting over that step. And look, everybody has that against Nick Saban. He's money in these games, man. Nick Saban handles his business. Like they 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 show up every single time. Um, yeah, I, I take Alabama. Boom! There we go. My wallet agrees with you um, and hopes that you are right. Um, all right, Alan Bell from CBS Sports Line here on the Unreasonable Odds podcast. Um, do you have anything going on that you want to tell us about? Because I know you got great content going on all the time. Yeah, definitely. I would just say, you know, the Early Edge podcast, it's show that we have, uh, you know, daily, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash sports line. It's a lot of fun, man. Um, other than that, man, uh, about it. Everybody have a great bull season. Let's finish NFL strong. There's some crazy games out there we talked about. Uh, sometimes the best plays are the ones that you don't go after. This isn't the time to chase, but yeah, other than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, beautiful. That is a jam-packed Unreasonable Odds episode for you guys. Um, for myself, Julian Edlow, uh, for my co-host, Steve Buchanan, for the podcast, which you can follow on Twitter, at Unreasonable Odd. For our guest, Alan Bell, for Johnny Avello, who comes on with us weekly. Um, Thank you guys for listening, and we will be back in 2022 and off of the holiday schedule and back with, uh, with plenty of content for you guys. Thank you all for listening.